Committee says the community has backed this project. Came up with the uh, $10,000 that we needed for the purse, which came from the community. Um, and I think that's very special in itself. We were looking at corporate sponsors. Uh, we had some outside interference uh, in the three months that we were planning the race. And uh, the community really pulled behind this race and supported it and sees the potential that it has. Not only have the people of the St. John Valley donated money for the event, but they've also donated manpower. As a matter of fact, they meet every Saturday and wardens, the law officers, forest rangers, ham radio operators, and several Fort Kent area residents are all volunteering their time to make sure that this is a huge success. This is definitely a major undertaking for the Can-Am Crown Committee, but so far they've been pretty happy with the progress made. This will be a 250-mile race with four checkpoints, the first one being in Portage. They'll continue on from Portage to Pelletier's Camps, from Pelletier's Camps to Maybeck Camps, on to Allagash, where they will then continue to Fort Kent. The mushers in the area are also looking forward to it. As a matter of fact, John Coletta of Eagle Lake, who is also the president of the Can-Am Crown Committee, will be racing in the event. It's the first time that his dogs will be going that distance. I'm really excited, but you know, there's a lot of unknowns out there. And uh, I'm really looking forward to getting on the trail and, uh, you know, getting out there with the dogs and kind of, um, kind of just seeing what's out there. Coletta said that he will be racing with 10 dogs in this event and that he will have to finish with at least seven. He said that the guidelines for this sort of event are pretty stringent and that there will be veterinarians at each point. And, you know, there's strict rules and guidelines. If the dogs are limping at all, they can't, they can't go on. If they're uh, coughing at all, they can't go on. So, that, you know, there's a whole mess of guidelines that, you know, that the veterinarians follow. And they have the final say. So, really, there's no inhumane treatment. You'll see today when we go out that dogs love this more than anything. It's like their thing and they want to get out there and do it. Both Coletta and Dumas are very excited about this undertaking and they see it continuing into the future as a great tourist industry. We could be part of a national circuit between like the Bear Grease in Minnesota, the Labrador 400. We're sitting right in the middle and we could bring, you know, a, a quite a few you know, people up there, a lot of mushers in here for a good week, which would really, I think, help the, the area. Forever and ever and ever and ever. Yeah. Uh, there's no reason why it shouldn't be. Too much work has gone into it for it not to be. Um, and and there's, there's no reason. We know we get snow every year, so why not capitalize on something that we get naturally? And the races will begin next Tuesday, 9 a.m. in Fort Kent. A limited number of advanced... Real busy day. We'll hear more about that and lots more. Dog race east of the Mississippi began in Fort Kent this morning. Nine teams took part in the 260-mile trek through the North Main Woods. It's a true test of endurance, man and dogs against Mother Nature, and 260 miles of wilderness. It may not be as challenging as the Iditarod, but these nine teams will be battling the elements in their quest to be crowned the first Can-Am sled dog champions. While some are out to win, others, including race organizer John Coletta, are out for the challenge. I'm ready to go. I'm not real happy about drawing number one, but just call me trail. I mean, everyone's going to be passing me on the way out, but if my dogs are ready, I'm ready. I'm just taking this as a long camping trip. I'm just going to enjoy it. The mushers don't just harness up the dogs and take off. First of all, they have to make sure that they have all of the safety equipment needed for two full days in the woods. They have a checklist that has to be filled out before they're able to take off, and all of their equipment is inspected by race organizers. All of Tony Simpson's equipment was in order. Simpson from England began sled dogging in the Antarctic when he was on exhibition work. This will be the longest race that he's ever been entered in. My game plan is to keep the dogs happy and look after the dogs. I'm running a young team. So I'm running some very young dogs, so my priority is um, go around, pace the dogs, and see how they're going. Well, some might be entered in their first long sled dog race ever. Others, like Don McEwen of Ontario, are veterans of this. McEwen has been racing for over 30 years now. He's also been entered in the Iditarod on several occasions. Just last week, he won a 150-mile race in Ontario, and he's looking forward to blazing trail in another frontier. Looking forward to a new race with no idea what's out there. At least six inches of snow are forecast over northern Maine over the next 24 hours. For some teams, it will slow them down, but for others, like for Barry Young of Rousseau, Ontario, it could be to his advantage. That'll help me. I have a, a fairly strong team, very powerful team. So I'm not the fastest, but I'm one of the strongest. So for the fast fellows, which there's one or two here that are really fast, the faster, the more snow will slow them down. So I, I like the snow.
Even though just nine hardy teams entered this year event, Lisa Duma of the Fort Kent Chamber of Commerce and also of the Can-Am Crown Committee feels that this could become part of the national circuit, which includes the Bear Grease in Minnesota and the Labrador 400. Duma also said that she couldn't believe the number of spectators who turned out to see the start of the race this morning. Really excited, fantastic, beautiful. It was uh, historic. It was, I think, the spectators uh, enjoyed it so much. We had uh, the volunteers. Uh, it, it's just the beginning of something great. I, I'm, I'm very excited. I'm very happy. Oh, and there are four uh, McEwen along with Paul Boudreaux and Andrew Netto are also all checked in. They have all also claimed their 12-hour layover for right now. One team has dropped out the Gardner-Smith team from Mars Hill. Four other teams are still uh, in their first. Andre Nadeau of Quebec were headed towards their second checkpoint last night. John Kalita of Eagle Lake was the first team to pull out of Fort Kent yesterday, and he was also the first to take a mandatory 12-hour layover at the first checkpoint in Portage. One of the original nine teams had to drop out yesterday because of equipment problems and a sick dog. The eight remaining teams will cover 250 miles across the St. John Valley. They're vying for a first prize of $2,500. That in the longest sled dog race east of the Mississippi, the eight teams have had to battle the snow, and that slowed them down considerably. As a matter of fact, four teams, Andre Netto of Quebec, Don McEwen of Ontario, Paul Boudreau of Ottawa, and Paul Terry of Noble Blur, Maine, all spent the night camped out at Big Machias Lake and all checked into the... Uh, Checkpoint at Peltsy's Camps a little after 12 today. Terrio at 12.51, Netto at 12.20, McEwen at 12.45, Paul Boudreau at 1.10. All four have taken their 12-hour layover. They'll be leaving sometime after midnight to head to the third checkout. Barry Young, along with John Coletta, and uh, Bill Wood and Tony Simpson are all expected to check in probably sometime around midnight. Well, it's time now for the SW Collins Tournament Scoreboard. Fort Kent, Andre Netto and his 11-dog team were back in Fort Kent as the new champions of the Can-Am Sled Dog Race. Netto toured the course in 54 hours and 28 minutes. He pulled in at 3.47 this morning. Netto said it was a very challenging course and that they ran into all kinds of weather during the trip. He also went on to say that he has a very strong team of dogs and they did well through the snow. He brought, his, he brought a team that was uh, really uh, trained for this kind of, these kinds of conditions. They were stronger dogs, uh, not as fast, but stronger, to carry a heavier load. It was quite a sight seeing Netto coming down the railroad tracks by Violet Settlement about a mile from Fort Kent. As a matter of fact, he left Allagash at 12.05 this morning and arrived in Fort Kent at 3.47, a very quick three-hour and 42-minute trip from the Allagash to Fort Kent. Lisa Duma of the Can-Am Crown Committee says that she was very happy to see this many people out at 4 o'clock in the morning. Fantastic that I was surprised that, uh, that, that there was even this many people here, but I guess uh, when I had talked to Mickey and he called people and they called people and Daryl called people to come and they just came. I mean, the interest is there and they wanted to see this guy come across. Netta will receive his award this evening at the American Dream Resort during an awards banquet there. And will he return next year? Should? No, I hope. If, yeah. there, if there is another race, I will return. <laughs> Defend your title. <laughs> for Defend the... the, the, the yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. Huh? That's it. Yes, he will. For the news, I'm Rainy Klukey. <laughs> thrill I get is um, seeing how well the dogs enjoy the activity. I get on the back of the, the sled there and the team really takes charge of the situation. I, I sort of let them know where they should go, but uh, they were fantastic. They have an intrinsic motivation to run. You just have to guide them, and uh, it works exceptionally well. Marty Caro has come a long way to do what few Australians have ever done. We do have sled dog racing in Australia, but it's all sprint racing. Um, ideally, we would love to get the snow fields. He's here to mush. Quite a storm yesterday. To take a sled. And a team of dogs. And race through the wilds of Northern America. Do you have a favourite dog? No, I don't. I try not to pick a favourite. Marty has spent the last three months training for this event. 
It's a grueling 110 kilometer course, the likes of which simply doesn't exist in Australia. Dogs are prohibited from national parks, so it's just probably talking with officials who run the national parks um, for them to get more involved with what we do to make this activity happen. Ready? I'm not out here to win any special prizes or awards. I'm out here to gain knowledge and experience. And uh, if I come in 5th, 15th or 50th, it wouldn't really worry me. Because I know that the dogs that are in front of me are doing their best, and that's all that matters. Two things you don't put together, sled dogging in Australia. I'm saying it just doesn't go. <laughs> Koalas maybe, but uh, it, uh, it's unique. It's something very different. Fort Kent, Maine. This is paradise for a musher. Hereabouts, winter hangs around for nearly six months of the year. It's a world away from Marty's life in the Royal Australian Navy. I never had a dog as a child. Never, ever. The first dog I ever had was a Siberian Husky that my wife talked me into, and that was, what, I don't know, seven years ago. It started as a hobby, but fast became an addiction. And, uh, I was more tempted to get physically involved with the dog, and when I heard about sled dog racing, and I thought, well, I've got a Siberian Husky here, I'll try that. And ever since then, I've just never looked back, and uh, it's been fantastic. Up until, I don't know, 12 hours before the race started, the trails were hard packed, they were great, it would have been a fast race, and then everything changed. The East Coast is being socked by another big winter storm. And winter storm warning in effect for all of Maine. Look out for today, winter storm warning today into tonight. Snow and windy today. So what did you think when you woke up this morning and saw all this snow? I thought it was great. I did, I thought it was great. I wish it was a little bit colder. These guys really perform better yeah. when it's much colder than that. Mm. But that's the only thing. It's a little bit warm, but the snow's great. Mm. It's amazing it's too hot for you. Yeah, <laughs> I've gotten used to it in a short period of time, I guess. Race morning, and with the snow came the mushes. Dozens of dogs anxious to get going. Pleasure. And their drivers just as impatient. You all set? Good. All set. Yeah. These are Siberian Huskies. They were brought over uh, from Siberia. Most of the dogs that you'll see today are Alaskan Huskies, which is really a crossbred animal, crossbred with hounds and so forth. And there's no question that they're faster. 18 teams, each made up of eight Huskies, have entered the race. What makes a good musher? A good musher. You gotta be nuts. I like being out with the dogs and the snow's great. I like to ride the back of the sled and uh, see the work of the dogs. I like better when it's colder. <laughs> uh, people in Australia would say you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. With the dogs checked. Okay, that's dog food. And the sleds packed. Handlers leave it to the very last moment to harness up their team. How are the dogs? Well, we're raring to go. They're about to pull this truck back off us if we don't get going shortly, so I better get going. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Five, four, three, two, one. It's a staggered start. Two minute intervals separate each team. Sydney, Australia. Marty draws number three. Five, four, three, two, one. Here they go. Let's push it well, ladies and gentlemen. Sydney. When we were on the trail, I knew that we were fine. I was totally relaxed. The dogs looked great. There was um, a few thousand people there. The dogs weren't upset with that. And just as long as they're happy, I'm happy. Going out to the first checkpoint was a beautiful run. The trail was great. There was only, it was, had a hard base. There was only an inch or maybe an inch and a half of snow on there. And the dogs were loping, loping nearly the whole way. That uh, run to that first checkpoint, 30 miles, was absolutely brilliant. I thought we were in for a great day. You got the camera out, Swing, swing the sled. 
at the first and only checkpoint. Hold it. The rookie from down under was on fire, holding his own against a field of world-class mushers. Quick stop here, the dogs don't need too much rest. Do I need to sign out? Yeah. Okay, all right. When we got to the first checkpoint, uh, we watered the dogs very quickly. They didn't need much water, they were quite happy. We left that checkpoint and from there to the finish is all uphill. And of course the snow came down and down and down. And we were going through six to eight inches of snow, so we were like breaking trail, and uh, as the other teams were too. And uh, it was very strenuous, very hard getting from that checkpoint back home. Uh, amazing and I'm glad to be in that situation how um, upsetting and difficult it was I'm glad that I've experienced it it was really good not everyone finished the race at the halfway point four teams dropped out and at times others wished they had too You think quite a bit out in the trail, especially for 65 miles, you know, and you're thinking, gee, that'll be great to come in third, you know, that'd be great. But um, when teams pass, so be it. I mean, that's the way it goes. Long race for a puppy, huh? You know that the dogs have done their best, and you've done your best. You've got to be happy with that. Come on, Amy. And that's the way it is. Sit here all night. We'll forget about Mr. Beer tonight. Okay. <laughs> the winner wore his victory like a crown. Do you see the frostbite he still had on his face from uh, earlier runs this week? I think he's been in colder weather here than he had ever been in before. Marty was running third for much of the race. <laughs> Only near the end were some of the hardened campaigners able to catch him. All right. Good run, my man. Thanks, Pete. Well, what'd you think of the snow out there? That was real hard work. <laughs> he still finished a credible eight. Not bad for a first-time Aussie. It's good. <laughs> Dogs are great. How do you think Marty went? Very good. Yeah, very good. If he's done this one, it's all over. He's got it in the vein. Once you get it in the vein, it's all over. It's an addiction. Are there times when you prefer a dog's company to a human's company? One thing with the dog's company, they never want anything. All they want is your love, and that's it. They do things because there's a reason for it. They're not doing it to purposely make you upset. I mean, it's just, uh, I love the dogs. I love the dogs. Was it harder than you thought? begin their special report on the great Can-Am 250. Welcome to Fort Kent, the last outpost in the final frontier. It's usually pretty quiet in these parts, except when the mushers come to town. That's when these hills come alive with the sound of huskies. It's called the Can-Am 250. A dog sled endurance race that's been known to make grown men cry. This year, 17 mushers are competing for $10,000 in prize money. The only rational question for these racers is, why do they do it? Let's start with Bob Hoyt, the mushing mailman from Ithaca, New York. Sort of an addiction. I got started in uh, every, every year, every race. I swear I'm not going to do this to myself again. And uh, next morning I wake up and figuring, figuring ways that I can do better next year. And what about Penny Gray? Can a woman compete in a grueling sport like dog sledding? It can be an advantage, you know, being light. But it's also, it can weigh against you too because you need uh, to muscle a heavily loaded sled around. You really need the weight of a, a bigger person. Of course, everyone's out to get last year's champ, Andre Nadeau. 
Easier said than done. They say this guy would run over his own grandmother if she got in the way of the finish line. On dirait que tout le monde court après toi. Tout le monde te vise. He says being a champion is, is, is a doable thing. But once you are champion, then everybody wants to bump you off. And he says that, that, puts, a, that puts some kind of a pressure on him. Now, last year, the mushers had to contend with a 15-inch snowstorm and temperatures that dropped to 38 below zero. This year, they may have to break out the suntan lotion. The race was set for Saturday, 9 a.m. The mushers lined up on Main Street, so did the fans. Sort of like a Hollywood movie, Sergeant Preston meets Call of the Wild. The racers were anxious. The dogs could hardly wait. Three, two, one, and they're off, the racers! From Fort Kent, the course heads south to the town of Portage, then west to Musquecook Lake, up to the Maybeck logging camp, through Allagash, and finally down the St. John River back into Fort Kent. The winner is expected to finish sometime Monday. Ahead, the first buddy. spectator ahead, point ahead. out of Fort Kent is here at Eagle Lake. So far, it's a pretty slow race. It's almost noon, and the first sleds are just getting here. You see, the Huskies don't like these balmy 30-degree temperatures. It makes the snow sticky. They'd much rather have it down around low zero. <laughs> At the first checkpoint, a surprise leader, young Tim McEwen. Somehow, he broke out of the pack and reached Portage just after 2.30. Wow. Yep. Any surprises out there? No. Perfect trail, nice marked. It was real good. Just a little slow because of the temperature. That's the only problem. Did you see anybody over your shoulder? You're, I was looking you're leading all the way here. Yeah, I didn't see anybody. So the question is, where's Andre? What happened to Penny? And has anybody seen Bob Hoyt, the mushing mailman from Ithaca, New York? For those answers and more, tune in tomorrow. Until then, I'm Bob Elliott, the Can-Am 250. Happened for the big race up in Fort Kent. They were hit with a tropical heat wave. Tonight, News Center's Bob Elliott brings us the exciting and unusual conclusion of the Can-Am 250. we left you, the Can-Am 250 was off and running. Rookie Tim McEwen took the early lead, but champion Andre Nadeau was right on his heels, almost like he planned it that way. Les chiens McEwen, ça a tout le temps été plus rapide que moi sur 100 000. C'est apparent. McEwen, he says McEwen's dogs have always been faster than mine for the first 100 miles. The next, uh, the miles after that will make the difference. Most of the mushers got to the first checkpoint late Saturday. The dogs spent the break eating and sleeping while the racers tried to figure out what to do about the 30-degree temperatures. Nice weather for people, but the Huskies were overheating and sinking through the snow. Penny Gray was in third place, but already worried about her dogs. What are your thoughts so far on the race? It's been hot. <laughs> Does that bother you more or the dogs, do you think? It it bothers the dogs a lot. It's really hard for them to, to go through stuff like this, you know, the heat. And uh, But they did really well. They just kept plugging along. And What's the strategy become now to uh, to run at night more, or what's, yeah. your, what's your plan? Yeah, definitely. If this wasn't very good for them, I'd, I definitely would try to run at night when it's cooler. And that's what most of the mushers did. We couldn't see him running at night, so we moved ahead to catch him at dawn, coming into Musquecook Lake. One problem, during the night, the temperature went up to an even higher 40 degrees and turned all the roads to ice. At this point, I have to apologize. There's not going to be any coverage of the race between points one and two. We've been stuck on this old logging road for four hours now. Snow tires change, nothing seems to help. No wonder they use dog sleds up here. By the time we got to checkpoint three at the Maybeck logging camp, the temperature was up to an unbelievable 50 degrees and rising. The vets were getting real worried about the dog's heat exhaustion. The symptoms? Dog's vomiting, don't want to eat, uh, don't want to drink, losing a lot of fluids. They would 
uh, diarrhea or vomiting. Those dogs, too, I'd like to keep here until they get back on their feet. Now, sometimes it's hard to tell who's winning a dog sled race. For example, in between Cook Lake down there and the Maybeck logging camp here, there's nothing but 42 miles of deep woods and wilderness. And the only way to keep score is sit and wait and watch. The first ones that show up are in first place. The ones that don't show up, well, that means they're lost and you got to go look for them. Finally, just after 7 a.m., a lone sled pulled into camp. The leader, Andre Nezu, who else? At this point, a lot of the other mushers were thinking about calling it quits. Not Andre. He was just hitting his stride. Okay, I want a witness here. What's your name? Gail. Gail who? Flag. Okay, uh, and you heard him say that he wants to keep going? Yes, I did. Okay. By mid-afternoon, the temperature got up to an unheard of 62 degrees. The trails were falling apart, the rivers were going underwater, and the judges had no choice but to call things off. Uh, canceling, canceling the race due to uh, the rivers are not passable, they're dangerous, and the dogs have been going through the ice, very dangerous, and they do not even want Andre to leave Maybeck. He will be playing number one as, as if he would have come back to finish fine. Andre wasn't too happy with the decision. He probably would have carried his dogs to the finish line if they'd let him. Still, he got first place. Tim McEwen came in second. Penny Gray was sixth, with Bob Hoyt, the mushing mailman from Ithaca, New York, finishing in ninth. Profound thoughts so far, or not so profound thoughts? What do you think so far? I still don't know why I do this. <laughs> Last year it was 38 below, this year it was 62 above. Talk about a meltdown, that's a 100 degree difference. What in the world can we expect next year? A typhoon? First place goes to Andre Nadal. Andre Nadal. Andre Nadal. <laughs> In Fort Kent, Bob Elliott, News Center. Playing the pictures. Tonight, photographer Steve Phillips' version of that race. He says, McEwen's dogs have always been faster than mine for the first hundred miles. The next, uh, the miles after that, will make the difference. What are your thoughts so far on the race? 
it's been hot. <laughs> Does that bother you more or the dogs, do you think? It, it bothers the dogs a lot. <laughs> I mean, they're counting every lips are going. <laughs> I'm going to stay here for about four hours and then uh, push on and try to get the next uh, checkpoint just about daybreak. have made it safely back to the Fort Kent finish and in very good time. And, you know, I think the cold is probably a big motivation. Actually, three teams are in and two are right on their way. Don Hibbs of Millinocket, Maine, officially won the race, crossing the finish line at 10.36 last night. Andre Neto came in at 1.01 this morning. Martin Massacott about an hour later at 2.07. And right now, Terry Atkins and Mike Murphy are on their way towards Fort Kent. Now, this is how it ended. In case you missed it Saturday, I'm going to give you a look at how the Can-Am crown began including some words from the winner, Don Hibbs. We go back to the start of the race with one prevailing question of strategy. To booty or not to booty? I haven't made up my mind. <laughs> that seems to be the question of the day today, because normally you would, in the start of a race like this, just prevent preventative you know, medicine as it was, you know, but the ice is such that the trail could be icy and the dogs could, I like to call it bambying, where their legs just go splayed out and they, you know, they can get hurt. I think we're going to booty, yeah. We, there's, there's been a lot of talk amongst the mushers this morning whether or not the, the, the thing to do is to booty, and I think we're... It's, uh, it's kind of a tricky call. The conditions are sort of marginal, but I think, I think when in doubt, I think the rule is uh, you put booties on. I, I'm going to booty about four dogs that I, um, that I have problems with and uh, tr as a preventative. And other dogs, right now I'm a little concerned that uh, they might not get traction everywhere if it's a little ice. And um, by bootying, you cover up their toenails, and then they lose that traction. The courses right now, we couldn't have asked for a better starting day with the temperatures this low. Um, everything is hard packed, and the snow that they're announcing is going to make for a wonderful, wonderful race. It's going to be a quick race. Uh, I wish they were a little slower, because my dogs tend to, tend to go out really hard and fast. I'm a little worried about some of these sharp turns, and as hard as the trail is. Dog races are, you take whatever conditions you get, and you live with them. This is the most confusing part. We're all waiting to get out on the trail and get out in the quiet where we can get with the dogs. Oh, I, I, I don't think it's, it's... I think you put too much pressure on yourself if you try to, to establish a kind of a numerical goal for yourself. Just, just to do the best you can and, and just key off the dogs rather than uh, the competition. Just going to try to keep going. That's about it. Try to take as little rest as we can and just keep moving on the trail. The Iditarod, of course, is a lot longer race and it's lots more grueling. A shorter race, you can uh, go a little faster, maybe push your dogs a little harder to finish a shorter race, whereas you have to rate them a little more for a long race like the Iditarod. I'm just going to run and rest and run and rest and see if I can run more and rest less than the other guys. 
seven of the 16 teams scratched, meaning they pulled out without finishing. So again, it's very impressive that Don Hibbs of Millinocket pulled in first late last night. Rainey will have the full results tonight on News Source 8 at 6. The Celtics are looking to pull above 500 yesterday, meeting the the Can-Am Crown sled dog races were held in this, this past weekend, actually, in Fort Kent. 57 teams from all over the Northeast turned out to race for $30,000 in prizes. In tonight's Green Outdoors report, New Center's Bill Green takes us to one of the biggest winter events in northern Louisiana. In just seven years, the Can-Am sled dog races have become an important event to northern Aroostook County and to Musher. One of the great things about the Can-Am dog sled race is that it starts in front of a loud crowd. And when those people are from Fort Kent, it's a great crowd too. The Can-Am is actually three races in one. Starting two minutes apart in Fort Kent's crowded main street, the teams head out on 30, 60, and 250 mile courses. This year, the course was particularly fast and the field the strongest ever. As a musher, it's the biggest race of the season for me. Um, I was fortunate I had a win at Sandwich, New Hampshire three weeks ago, but I hadn't raced the Canadians, and they're always very competitive, so um, this is what I've been looking forward to all season. Mike Murphy from Newbury, Michigan. Each course goes to a separate place. 30 and 60 mile races finish in a day. The 250 milers often go out for two overnight. 56 teams turned out for the three events, a big field considering the race is just six years old. They are off. Uh, we never thought it would turn out something like this. The first race we had was 1993. We had nine mushers. It turned into this, three, three races, uh, seven years later, and I couldn't be happier. how Dad look today? Good. Good. In the 30-miler, Danny O'Farrell showed the Canadian prominence. He overcame a wrong turn to come across the finish line first by five minutes. Hey, hey, get we, were, we were two teams, uh, me and Paul. Yeah. So we, we had went by in the wrong way, both of us. Yeah. So then we came back, and we stopped together, and then I watched her team. And then she went to see what, what side was the, the path to turn uh, yeah. on this side. So we went back up and uh, it lasts maybe uh, five minutes for sure. The Americans scored a big win in the 250. Don Hibbs of Millinocket came home the winner, beating his own course record. Watching the dogs go is a great thrill, and it's not surprising that this race is starting to attract such a crowd. In Fort Kent, Bill Green, New Center. And the race committee split up the purse just a couple of hours ago. Don Hibbs of Millinocket will take close to $10,000 for his weekend at the races. But Don Hibbs of Millinocket finished the 250-mile race a little after 10.30 last night. That's the quickest 250 yet. Hibbs and the rest of the field had to battle heavy winds and snow during parts of the event that started and ended in Fort Kent. Andre Netto and Martin Massacott were second and third, and Mike Murphy of Newberry, Michigan was fourth. This was Murphy's first 250. I'm kind of a back of the packer. I just, two weeks ago, I finished last at the UP 216th. Of course, that was, there was 35 teams that started, so I, that was still all right. But no, I wasn't expecting this finish at all. It was a real surprise. 16 teams started the race on Saturday morning in chilly temperatures, and throughout Saturday, the weather actually stayed pretty good. And then, of course, on Sunday and Sunday night, the wind and snow came in, and that forced some of the teams to drop out. John Osmond of Shirley was racing in his third Can-Am 250. He crossed the line this morning and said he was pleased with the way his dogs ran. I feel all right. <clears throat> I think the dogs deserve more like a third or fourth place. Uh, the musher deserves more like an eighth or ninth. You know, a couple strategy, you know, strategic errors there. Uh, other than that, the, the, the dogs rocked 90% of the way. They, they ran real well. Spectators have been out in force watching the competitors as they have crossed the finish line, including Dean Golden of Minnesota, who crossed late this afternoon. The competitors all agree whether it's Osmond who's running in his third race or Murphy who's running in his first Can-Am. It's Dean. the people that make this race special. Uh, it's the people. It's the people. It's the town. It's the race. It's the, it's the whole thing, you know. It's the race. It's 
makes it. I left the uh, the Maybeck checkpoint, and one of the gals there asked me if I wanted some food for the trail, and she comes out, and she's got a bag that weighs about 13 pounds with sandwiches and brownies and cookies, and the people were friendly, and um, the help at the checkpoint's just super. You know, everybody was pitching in, what can we do for you, you know, what can we do for your dogs, and it was excellent. I was really impressed. One team is still on the trail. Ben Thomas checked into the Allegash checkpoint at a little after two this afternoon. The Mushers banquet is tomorrow night in Fort Kent. Good luck. Don Hibbs with Spider and Jasper. The can -Am sled dog race is the perfect event for a town that has a frontier feel. This once was a frontier, a kind of no man's land between the U.S. and Canada. When the British drove the French from Nova Scotia, many retreated here to this stretch of the St. John River. Uh, from 17, 1785, this was known as the Madawaska Republic, and uh, there was no country. The people were, you know, they just lived here without any allegiance to anybody. And then I think Britain wanted to go down to a claim down to Mars Hill, being part of Canada, and we said we'd go up to the St. Uh, Lawrence River. So this bloodless Aroostook War I was uh, get being set up. The state of Maine sent a 10,000-man militia north to battle along the border. There was no doubt Maine wanted war. New Brunswick Governor John Harvey did not. Now, President Martin Van Buren didn't want war either. He sent Daniel Webster to negotiate a peace with honor in Aroostook County. 130 years later, President Richard Nixon would use that phrase, peace with honor, as he attempted to negotiate a way out of Vietnam. The early Acadians were joined by many more French Canadians from northern Quebec late in the 19th century. Fort Kent today has a large Franco-American population, and townsfolk are proud of that heritage. There's a movement right now in the valley that we are trying to uh, get French back into our homes. Um, a lot of people are they're not for it. They think English should be the only language. But up here, it's, um, it's a definitely an asset for us in the valley being so close to the border. There is an optimism in Fort Kent. The town is aided culturally by a University of Maine campus, and because of its presence, MBNA is bringing a hundred jobs by building a call center right near the town's ski slope. And today, a bridge reaches across the St. John at Fort Kent, connecting people from two different countries that share a common heritage. If you love winter sports and great people, you will love Fort Kent. A great time to visit is for the can -Ams. In Fort Kent, Bill Green, News Center. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Bill Green's Maine. You know, a lot of Mainers, especially those from southern Maine, have never been way up to the St. John Valley, and it's too bad, too, because it's a physically beautiful place. And not only that, there's a strong Franco influence there, which gives a special spirit to area events. Now you can see all this every year at the Can-Am Crown Sled Dog Races, which start and end in Fort Kent. <laughs> The singer proclaims that life is a game. If you are lucky, you will win. This is the ninth Can-Am Crown 250 in Fort Kent. It is a real community event, complete with hot coffee, wood fires, and Franco-American spirit. And you need a little of each this morning. It was 25 below at 7 a.m. Fort Kent's an excellent place. One of the best dog races in the country. I love the big crowd. Yeah. <laughs> The Can-Am Crown is actually three races in one. The teams start two minutes apart. Shorter races of 30 and 60 miles complement the 250. Sled dog teams can average as much as 12 miles an hour. Mushers in the 250 will spend one, two, or even three nights out on the trail. There are four checkpoints. Here, the teams can be bedded down and fed. Dry gas is used to heat the dog's food. Everything must be carried by the musher. The rest is welcome. The food devoured rapidly. Musher and dog are in this ordeal together. They rally each other. Each driver must rest eight hours total at the first three checkpoints. Now where and when they take that rest often determines who wins and who doesn't. I don't like this. Stan Passanani of Minnesota is in the lead, but he's worried because he knows he should be ahead by more. 
His team is not resting well. They want to run. We had some icy roads out there where, man, I rolled that brake as hard as I could for probably a, probably five miles. Just, and that's the spot normally this team, you would let them go and they would roll. But it was, their legs were kind of going out, so you got to watch those shoulder muscles. Dan's friend Keith Ilo is just minutes behind. His team's not as fast, but they are more powerful, which should serve him well in the big hills ahead. Dan's got a little bit faster dog team, but I don't know how strong they are, so we'll find out. Back in Fort Kent, the shorter races are finishing. Robert Fredet has had a great run. It looks like he will win, but through an interpreter, he tells me, his dog literally stopped for 10 minutes, just two miles from the finish. Once the other team went by him, then his dog stuck off again. The big teams roll through the Aroostook County countryside. Occasionally, one overtakes another. The team being passed must give plenty of trail to the team which is overtaking them. But as the race goes on, the musher is more often left alone with his thoughts and his team. Number 24, Andre. Yeah. Watching this race closely is three-time Can-Am champion Don Hibbs of Millinocket. He withdrew just before the morning start because his dogs were not 100%. He's watching closely and learning about his competition. These are veteran drivers. They've already been in some tough races this year. They've uh, they've sorted out, you know, the uh, the less capable dogs and the, the dogs that are in this race. These two guys, 12 dog teams. These are all very good dogs. These are the least canine athletes you're looking at here. And uh, I, w I wouldn't I wouldn't think that anything uh, drastic is going to happen negative to either 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 driver. Each year, the population of Fort Kent doubles for the Can-Am Crown races. But if you ever go up, don't think of it as just a race, because it is so much more. It is a community event, a spectacle in itself, and a test. A test of relationships between musher and dog. The Can-Am sled dog races are a wonderful thing to see, and almost any time is a great time to visit the St. John Valley. Now, when we come back, we'll visit an old friend who rose from humble origins to become governor of Maine. Stay tuned as Bill Green's Maine continues.